our power today. Welcome to Progress Radio, where progress is heard. Hello, I'm Jen Coltrider of Progress Now. The hearings for John Roberts, President Bush's nominee to replace William Rehnquist as Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, are upon us. Joining me to discuss the importance of these hearings and the potential of John Roberts as a member of the U.S. Supreme Court is Jean Dabosky. Jean was the first woman appointed to serve on Colorado's Supreme Court and also successfully argued against Colorado's anti-gay amendment too in front of the United States Supreme Court. Jean joins us today as one of the most qualified voices to discuss the issues and qualifications of John Roberts as a Supreme Court Justice as we go through these important Senate hearings. Thanks for joining us, Jean. Thank you, Jen. You argued Amendment 2 in front of the U.S. Supreme Court, and you told us the last time you visited us with us that actually John Roberts helped you prepare for it. How did he help you, and what was your thoughts of him at the time? Well, he helped by providing me some very good advice as to how to deal with issues that had been before the court before in the sense that um, Bowers versus Hardwick, an earlier precedent, had had language that was extremely anti-gay. It was the only prior gay rights case before the court. How to deal with a court that was still made up of people who had voted on those issues and basically what kinds of things the court would be interested in the Amendment 2 case. It was interesting talking with him about it because you really, at least I didn't get any personal sense at all of what his views really were. I mean, he was interested in the case because it was a very difficult legal case and very challenging, and I think that's what intrigued him about it. But I didn't get much sense that he would be an advocate for gay rights particularly. And everything I've read about him, people say pretty much the same thing, that it's very difficult to read what his personal views are on about anything. That he's very good at dealing with people across the political spectrum. That he has lots of personal friends who are liberal Democrats. That he has lots of personal friends who are conservative. And I think someone uh, with his background and personality understands the people he's with most of the time to avoid saying anything that they'll find offensive. He's not one of these people who's in your face. I mean, I think Justice Scalia, for example, really gets a big kick out of saying things to people that they might not agree with. But I don't think John Roberts is like that. So having worked with him, having gotten his assistance, what kind of justice do you think he will be? I think he is as qualified to be on the U.S. Supreme Court from a legal sense as anyone who could be appointed. He's very bright. He writes very well. He l seems to listen very well. I think his personality will be one that will be more of a uh, getting people together on issues as opposed to having a splintered accord as you've been having. So I think his power may be both in his intellect and his ability to work with all kinds of people. And that could mean that the court is a more effective conservative court, if that's the way he goes. And it wouldn't surprise me if, if that happens. So it sounds like you are in favor of, of him. Well, I think it's very difficult to vote against him in the sense that I don't think one one necessarily votes against a Democrat because one's a Republican or against a Republican because one's a Democrat or against a conservative because one's a liberal or against a, a liberal because one's a conservative. I think he's very skilled. I think you couldn't find anyone who's probably got stronger qualifications from his background. At the same time, I think one needs to understand that the U.S. Supreme Court is really a, a political body as much as a legal body and that it has the power to move some issues in this country in very dramatic ways. They tend to be the issues that are the most controversial that one cannot get popular agreement on or for a variety of reasons the Congress cannot act upon issues. So those tend to be the things that end up in court and the reason that the court makes what are essentially political decisions. It's sort of there's a vacuum and the court fills it. I am concerned 
mostly that the court will take some directions, particularly around congressional power, that will remove the ability of Congress and the federal government to resolve problems that for a variety of reasons can't be resolved in the states. And I've liked the balance of power in this country for a long time in the sense that many of the things that desperately needed attending to, whether it was civil rights issues or environmental issues, got attended to by the federal government. I think those things are less likely to be well attended to at the state level. One of the things that Roberts has been touted as, um, especially for the supporters on the right, is he's a strict constructionist. What does that mean? Oh, I don't think they know what it means. It basically means that you're on my side on a given case. Um, the U.S. Constitution is a very general document that was written more than 200 years ago when the times were very different. And the people who talk about strict construction of the U.S. Constitution also talk about going back to its original meaning. Well, they're really talking, that's all code language for states' rights. Um, so what they're really talking about is less power for the federal government, more power for the states. But really only on the issues that they don't like what the federal government has done on. You know, they don't, they're perfectly happy to have uh, federal power uh, through uh, all of the new security laws, the Patriot Act and Homeland Security legislation, that kind of thing. They're perfectly happy with federal power there, but they don't like federal power basically going back to civil rights issues. It's amazing that, you know, 150 years after the Civil War, many of the things in this country are still uneasy um, around issues involving race. And I think that's what's behind a lot of a lot of the very conservative efforts to talk about strict construction. But these conservatives say they're happy because he is one. Is he one, or do we know yet? Oh, I don't think so. Uh, I think he's much more sophisticated about things than they they picture him as being. I think the White House lobbied awfully hard to get most of those organizations in line. I think many of them are a little uneasy as to whether he'll turn out to be what they think he's going to turn out to be. Well, I know, for example, when the article came out recently in the LA Times talking about how um, he had helped you with Amendment 2, that really caused a bit of an uproar in the conservative community, leading to some groups withdrawing their support of him. What's your take on that? Well, it's interesting because I have a friend who's a very well-placed lobbyist in Washington who happens to be co-chair of the Human Rights Campaign right now. And I was talking to him about where in the world the story came from about Roberts helping on Amendment 2, because I wasn't the one who started the story. And he said, well, one of the rumors around Washington was that the White House had started it, because the right doesn't have anywhere to go in support of Roberts, and the White House would like for this one to go through with very little fuss. They they would like to get him in place, and then maybe the next time they can have more of a battle with someone. Um, who knows? But they'd like this one to go through quickly and without too much controversy. And indeed, they appointed somebody who will probably come as close to getting through without too much controversy and still is a fairly strong conservative as they could have. So why would them leaking the story to the press about him helping you on Amendment 2, how would that help them push him through? Why would that make it less of an argument? Because the Democrats would think this is someone who may not be as conservative as he's being touted to be. And I think there are a lot of people who, who feel that way about him. I mean, I don't know. I've met him. My general sense from meeting him was that he was very, very capable and very, very smart and certainly open-minded. And if you've got somebody who's relatively open-minded, you often are tempted to think he probably isn't going to be too conservative. But he could be. You just don't know. Were you surprised by the firestorm that it caused when it got out in the national press that he had helped you on Amendment 2? 
Well, I said to one reporter, I think she was from the Wall Street Journal, there must not be anything else going on in Washington right now. This was early August. And she said, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> it did cause quite of a stir. Oh, dear. So you talk about how they want to get this one through with relative ease to, to, so that down the road they might have a, a, a better chance for a fight or a, to get someone through with a fight. How does the way this nomination goes through in the hearings, the questions that get asked, the way it's, it's voted on, how does that lay the groundwork for the next go-round? Well, the next go-round will probably come pretty soon. I suspect that that nominee will either be Hispanic or a woman. And if this one goes through without too much of a fight, uh, it'll make it that much easier for the next person. It'll be as, as if, well, you know, how many times are we going to gear up like this? And it's as if everyone got all geared up for this, and now people don't quite know what to do about it. So it takes a little of the heat off the issue, and people won't pay as much attention to it. So for the progressive side of the spectrum, what does that mean? How should they approach these hearings? Is there anything they can do to help lay their groundwork for the future? Well, I think it is very important for people to understand how important the election of president and the election of members of the Senate is to who serves on the U.S. Supreme Court. And the next appointment, not this one, but the next appointment will start changing the balance on abortion and a lot of other issues, the 5-4, I mean the 6-3 votes, let's say. That's, that's the appointment that will make a big difference. But there are a lot of old people on that court, and any number of them could be replaced during George W. Bush's term in office, and who knows who the next president will be. So my general sense is that each one of these is an opportunity for progressives to help educate people about how important who is on the U.S. Supreme Court really is. And it's not just a question of electing the president. It's also a question of who controls the Senate because he would, the president would have a much tougher time getting these these, I should say, who knows who they'll be, but they'll probably be far-right nominees through if the numbers in the Senate were either more equal or the Democrats controlled the Senate. It's pretty scary when uh, conservative Republicans control all the branches of government, and they do now. Last time we spoke, you told us what the term judicial act activist meant to you and how you, you as a Supreme Court justice here in Colorado, said you like to look at the facts and make your decision bef and not prejudge things. What is a judicial activist and what should people be aware of in regards to the Supreme Court on that topic? Well, judicial activist is a term that is normally used by conservatives to mean a liberal judge, i.e. someone who decides cases in ways that that person doesn't like. I think a judicial activist is someone who reaches out to decide more than needs to be decided on any particular case or who comes into each case with a particular philosophy and the case is going to be decided or is pre-decided on the basis of that person's philosophy. I really don't think in judging it's fair to the parties who appear before the court to have either pre-announced one's views of a particular case or to make a decision in a case because it is consistent with one's particular philosophical theory. You don't want judges at these hearings announcing how they're going to decide all a whole category of cases that come before them, and that's why you get people saying, I'm not going to answer that question because I think judges are pretty sensitive to the appearance of fairness and why our courts remain legitimate institutions as long as most people think they can come before a court and the court will listen to their side of the story. And um, an activist judge, to my point of view, is someone who is really coming into most cases with a personal agenda. As the hearings go along, we're going to hear a lot of 
talk about specific issues. Um, one of them is right to privacy. What are we going to hear about that, and, and what are some of the concerns about right to privacy in regards to John Roberts? Well, right to privacy is the basis for laws that have made contraceptives available, a right to abortion, gay rights, gay sex, and uh, search and seizure laws. Search and seizure being a criminal law concept that you can't, the police can't just break into someone's house without a warrant. And it's rather interesting because privacy tends to be a big value or an important value for libertarians. And the morality around gay sex uh, or abortion is something that the religious right is particularly concerned about. So it's pretty hard to tell how a conservative is going to come out on those issues. Justice Scalia has written some pro-criminal defendant decisions in the search and seizure area because you're protecting the right to one's privacy in one's home. But it tends to depend upon the issue and then upon what the person is as a personal philosophy, whether one is more libertarian or more social conservative, as to how one comes out on each of those cases. And it's very hard to predict without uh, knowing the context in which the issue is coming up. So with John Roberts in regard to right to privacy, we are just going to have to guess? I think wait and see. And the, the right to privacy issues are very important because, I mean, they're the ones I think we're probably going to hear about the most because they involve abortion and the gay rights. Yes. And so the, the pro-choice groups are going to be very concerned about the right to privacy, as, as are the, the, the gay rights groups. Well, and, and women's rights groups also, because it's not an accident that contraceptives became readily available at the, about the same time women started being able to go on to graduate school or have jobs that left them with challenging work outside the home. And I think there's a lot of concern that if you start rolling back uh, the abortion decisions, right under that are the contraceptive decisions, and, you know, they're having a lot of trouble uh, in the FDA right now in releasing a contraceptive pill that, for all the health study reasons, ought to be available over the counter. And social conservatives don't want that to happen, and so if you've got somebody who's basing most decisions on, on the morality that is pushed by the social conservatives, you could well lose some of those protections. So I think you'll see some questioning around uh, availability of contraceptives. Roberts, in, in the writings that I saw, he's referred to it as the so-called right to privacy. So how does that make you feel? I think he'll be more careful about it uh, as a member of the U.S. Supreme Court. I mean, he has said that he has respect for law and the incremental ways in which decisions are made. The right to privacy is pretty well embedded now in the concept of our constitutional law, and I think it'll take a while to overturn it, and I don't think he's a person who's going to go charging out in any particular direction. I think he'll decide each case one by one, and he'll, it'll reflect a, a, a direction of decisions, but... U.S. Supreme Court judges tend to be a little more liberal or progressive than you think they're going to be when they get appointed to the court. What about the Equal Protection Clause? That's um, equal protection under the law. That's yeah. some, another thing we'll hear about. What is, what is that? Who does it affect? And what might we see? Well, those are the civil rights laws. Uh, the Equal Protection Clause in the U.S. Constitution by itself is pretty meaningless. It's sort of a measuring stick for whether courts can decide that some group has been discriminated against. If you're entitled to equal protection, what does that mean? The clause is basically to say, well, people should be treated in the same way. Um, what's important, I think, are the federal laws that have implemented equal protection. And again, you see that primarily in the affirmative action laws, uh, in, in employment uh, equal employment opportunity laws, all of those are grounded in equal protection, but they are efforts to remedy or to, pre to remedy past discrimination in terms of affirmative action or to prevent ongoing uh, discrimination in terms of equal employment. 
and all of those cases get heard by the U.S. Supreme Court. They come up in any number of ways. There are also all of the uh, disability laws that have been adopted in recent years, and the U.S. Supreme Court has knocked out some of them, uh, but upheld others. What might be a question that we'll hear asked of Roberts concerning equal protection, and what might be an answer we might hear? I think he will say that he believes that all people should be treated equally. I mean, he'll give very general answers that won't offend anyone, and then I think he will not answer specific questions about specific programs. I don't think he'd ever answer a question about, well, what would you do about Title IX if you got that case, the, the discrimination in uh, universities, and uh, I don't think he'd answer the question. Another one we'll probably hear about is separation of church and state. Um, what, where is that? Is there a separation of church and state? I think that's an argument you hear a lot. And what might we expect from Roberts on that one? I think he'll be conservative on that issue. I think the U.S. Supreme Court has been so wishy-washy about separation of church and state in the past decade or two that it will be very easy for him without going beyond his normal what I would think would be normal incrementalism, just not taking great big steps to be very much on the side of, well, you know, we can have, we already allow uh, federal money to go to church schools and we've upheld some faith-based initiatives. It's, it's um, not too difficult from that to say, well, you know, if people aren't required to participate in a prayer, you can certainly have a prayer in a lot of different circumstances. So I think we'll see a lot more uh, religion allowed in public life. And I think the Pledge of Allegiance will continue to contain under God, those sorts of things. What does that mean for the long haul? I mean, there's, it's a, it, we see a, almost a slow shift. The, the religious right has kind of pushed and pushed and pushed, so we're seeing more religion in our public life. But what does that mean for the long haul? Well, I think it means, if we're not careful, that people will become much less tolerant of people who don't share their religious views and that um, there will be a major effort by social conservatives to dominate, whether it's school boards or local city councils or anything of that sort. There'll be a, a much more open political religious agenda uh, you see it in terms of teaching evolution in the schools. I mean, I really thought that issue was resolved uh, with the Scopes trial, and here it is almost 100 years later, and it's back again. And I think that uh, homeschooling has become a major way of putting religion back in the education that kids get. It's certainly been much more effective at doing that than Catholic schools have been in recent years. There are not nearly as many Catholic schools as there used to be. So I think religion and public life will be there in different ways than it has been in the past. But it's easy to forget that um, we had lots of religion in our public schools. There were always prayers and meetings began with prayers and all that sort of thing. And it certainly was Protestantism for the most part. Uh, 50 years ago, so I'm not sure overall it's going to be that much different. Which brings us to the last issue I want to talk about, which is Roe v. Wade. Yes. Everybody's talking about, will Roe v. Wade stand up with an appointment of John Roberts to the Supreme Court? What do you think? Well, that was one in which Justice Kennedy, Justice Souter, and Justice O'Connor had come together in a, a sort of here's our view of this, and they adopted uh, a position in the most recent case in which Roe v. Wade was at issue. I think that Souter and Kennedy will probably stay where they were, so I think that will mean that there's a 5-4 vote to uphold basic Roe v. Wade. Now, it'll be interesting to see cases on partial birth abortions or things of that sort. You may see that some of those issues are decided slightly differently. 
those may be there may be some cases that Justice Kennedy, for example, uh, would not stay with a, a Roe v. Wade majority and would go uh, in a different in a different way. And it's hard for me to even think of all the ways some of this stuff can come up because partial birth abortion isn't something I would have thought was a major issue in the country. Um, anyone challenging the FDA not letting contraceptive pills be sold over the counter, for example, that could be an interesting way in which uh, some of the issues that are really involved in Roe get decided by the courts in, in the next few years. So it's, it's difficult to predict. I don't think the availability of, of abortion in at least the first trimester and probably the first two trimesters of a pregnancy is going to go away anytime soon. It seems like the Roe v. Wade isn't being attacked in, its, in itself. It's being attacked in small, well, you have to get parental consent and, you know, partial birth, the birth abortion, you can't cross state lines to have an abortion. It's, it's more of a slow, as you said earlier, the slow kind of small changes that occur over time. Is, is that, are we going to see that continue? I think yes. And perhaps some of that isn't as dangerous as people want to make it seem because even nibbling along around the edges doesn't always mean that the core decision is going to be overturned. I think when you start nibbling around the edges on any issue, and I don't mean to not take it seriously when I say nibble around the edges, but I just mean that there are a lot of sort of tangential questions that could be decided. I don't think that necessarily means that um, Roe itself will be overturned. I guess I think sometimes politically there hasn't been enough give on some of the issues. It's almost like there's a fight to the death on each one of them and I would think that we could be confident enough that Roe is not going to be overturned, that you could let a few things go. It's good to have you as our voice of reason. Sometimes we progressives and liberals and lefties, we like to just fly out on a limb. And it's nice to have you come in and keep us sane. So I have one last question. So tomorrow, Senator Ken Salazar calls you up and says, I have one question to ask Roberts, and I want you to tell me what I should ask. What do you tell him? What's the one question you would like to hear Roberts ask and have him answer? I would like to hear him answer a question about um, affirmative action. A specific question or just a general question? Well, I would like to know what he thinks about the affirmative action uh, laws and whether they are required under the 14th Amendment and the Equal Protection Clause and what he thinks about the cases decided in the U.S. Supreme Court involving uh, the Texas and Michigan programs. I'd just like to hear him talk a little about that, not necessarily how he would decide a future case, but I'd like to hear him talk a little about that because I think that's sort of the center of the federalism and, and states' rights debate that I'm most concerned about, and that's the, the issue that I'm most concerned about. And what answer could he give that would make you feel better about his appointment to the Supreme Court? I think an understanding that the health of our country depends upon supporting and promoting the d opportunities for diverse citizens and that diversity and appreciating different types of people in this country is what really makes it strong. I don't think he'd say that, but I'd like to hear something like that. And will he be confirmed? Oh, I think easily. Well, that's all I have. Thanks so much for coming in and enlightening us, being oh, our voice of reason. Sure. You're welcome. Thank you for listening to Progress Radio, where progress is heard. Progress Radio is part of Progress Now Action. Please go to progressnow.org for more information on this and many other progressive issues.